Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller, and I'm delighted to say that my guest today is winner of the 2009 Booker Prize for Fiction, Hilary Mantel, whose book, Wolf Hall, was praised by James Nochte, Chairman of the Judges, for its ambition and boldness, and the challenges it offers the reader, and therefore the rewards it brings. The book portrays the court of Henry VIII, its machinations and marital tribulations, through the eyes of Thomas Cromwell, a man described by historian David Starkey as Alistair Campbell with an axe. That there is very much more to him than that is richly apparent from Hilary Mantel's novel. Here's the interview. I wanted to start with the Hans Holbein portrait of Thomas Cromwell, which I think will be familiar to a lot of people and maybe shape, to a large extent, their view of Cromwell the man as someone who's who's hard, cruel, cold, um, lots of negative connotations perhaps attached to that. And that portrait itself you incorporate into the fabric of the novel, and I thought that was a very clever way, in a way, of taking, uh, acknowledging the fact of that portrait and weaving it into um, Cromwell's view of himself and views of others around him. Can you say a bit about about that scene, which happens quite late in the novel, and what you were, what you were doing there with with images of the man. Yes, I, I think when Holbein painted a courtier, he was in a way painting the man's office, and a, a Tudor a minister didn't want to look pretty; he just wanted to look powerful. But of course, because Holbein's a genius, there's always an extra dimension there. In my book, when Cromwell sees the portrait, he is rather shocked by it. He's got no illusions about being handsome, but the hardness of the portrait takes him by surprise. Either the way his hand is gripping the roll of paper as if it's an offensive weapon. And he says, I look like a murderer. And his son says to him, didn't you know? which is quite a shocking moment, really. Now, what I noticed immediately about the picture is how Cromwell is penned into a small space. It looks as if Holbein has said, sit there, and then he's pushed the table against him. There's another table at the side of him. He actually can't move. And in my second book, Cromwell learns to live with the portrait, but he realises increasingly that Hans was right, he can't move. His scope of action as an idealist as opposed to a practical politician is now severely curtailed. And so he says, artists know the truth before we do. So I wanted to consider what might be the experience of having your portrait in your house learning to relate to it as, as another self. And then later, though, this is out with the scope of the book, the original gets lost, which is quite piquant because, of course, I think the original Cromwell has got lost. So it's a sort of moment of confrontation, really, of him seeing himself in a, an outsider's perspective, which in the book itself, maybe he's not, he's not confronted with so very often. Yes, I don't think any of us can be aware, even now in an age when we see multiple photographs of ourselves, of quite how we present ourselves to others. And in this age, of course, images were much rarer. And it's perhaps rather unfortunate that that portrait and, and the miniature, which is very akin to it, are the only images we, we have of Cromwell. Yeah. Or the, they're the only surviving images anyway. And certainly you have a sense of a very grim person, which is very much at odds with the picture the Spanish ambassador gives of him, because he emphasises that in conversation, Cromwell is someone who lights up and that heavy face is mobile and his eyes are always on your face and he's always the ambassador says trying to work out what you make of what he's just told you so you get almost the opposite impression 
And of course, he was a man of terrific energy. And that's why it interests me that Holbein seems to append him in there so that he's forced into stillness. It's as if someone is forced into taking stock of themselves. I know that Wolf Hall is a book that you wanted to write for a long time, and I wondered, did you, those years ago, know that you wanted to write about the Tudor court, but not that Thomas Cromwell was going to be the way to do it, or was Cromwell always, from the very first time you conceived the project, was he the way into that world? Very much I wanted to write about Cromwell. There isn't any other figure I would have picked. He was the main attraction because I was really interested in the path he took from very humble origins to the councils of state, to be the king's right-hand man, to be an earl. Other people rise from a humble background, but they invariably come through the church. Cromwell didn't take that path. He, he very much created the conditions in which he could succeed. But by doing so, huge backwash of resentment and ill will, which I suppose must have seemed in his own mind indefeasible at times. He had the, the example before him of his patron and mentor, Cardinal Wolsey, and, and his fall from power. And so you might say he must have known that all along he was bound not to succeed. And you know that saying, all political careers end in failure sooner or later. But he obviously thought the game was worth the candle. Yeah. With the odds stacked against him, he, he persevered. And if he had been able to do even a fraction of what he would have liked to do, the, the country would have been a very different place. But he was always fighting against a self-interested parliament and against entrenched conservative interests. But I'm interested in the radicalism of his thought, which I will be able to unfold more in the sequel to Wolf Hall. As a novelist, it must have been attractive to you that there was a big blank in his, from his mid-teens to his mid-twenties when he goes abroad. We, we, we know really very little about what he was doing. And I imagine that that allows you certain imaginative freedom as a writer. Yes, it did, although I, I chose not to construct his story. I chose to construct it only through his memory, which comes in flashes. I wanted to, to catch the process of memory as it's happening, which is haphazard, really, not logical. And we never know what triggers episodes of the past to come back and possess us. So that was the way I wanted to work it. I think we're pretty sure that he did join the French army after he'd run away from home at the age of around 15. And then there are various sightings of him in different Italian cities. The various rumours, some of which are collected by John Fox in, in the Book of Martyrs, all these stories can't be true but they're all of interest and because I'm without sources really for this time of his life there's a really rubbishy Elizabethan play about Thomas Cromwell which is obviously the product of many different hands and seems to be various different plays as well mixed together but in this play Cromwell is a kind of trickster figure and he goes around Europe with his comic manservant and they have adventures. And I thought that I would try to preserve in my presentation of his character something of this tradition, which is obviously how the Elizabethans saw him. And many of the stories that John Fox tells about him, though you wouldn't think it of the Book of Martyrs, but they they have a certain blackly comic flavour and I wanted to try to preserve that as well. This is Elizabethan tradition but it's the nearest thing we have to go on and it wasn't until later that Cromwell became the unsmiling and grim figure of the portrait.